I met a woman who had just gone through a cancer treatment. And as a result of the cancer treatment, she ended up having an early hysterectomy. And she said, this caused me to go into early menopause. She said, if I would have had your sheets when I was going through this, I think my rehabilitation would have been better. So I'm sitting there like crying with this woman thinking like, God, if I could have just started this sooner, maybe I could have helped more people. So my like little psychology heart was like, oh, I just want to help people. And at that same moment, her husband walked up and he was like, I don't know what you're selling, but I'm buying. How much money do you need to get this thing off the ground? The startup investment landscape is changing and world-class companies are being built outside of Silicon Valley. We find them, talk with them, and discuss the upside of investing in them. Welcome to Upside. Hello, 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 and welcome to the Upside Podcast. First podcast, finding upside outside of Silicon Valley. I'm Eric Hornung, and I'm accompanied by my co-host, Mr. Hot Apartment himself, Jay Klaus. Jay, how's it hanging? It's going well. Hot Apartment. Is this a delayed complaint from the last time you, you stayed in my apartment? No, this is, we talked last week, and you told me that you have been sleeping very poorly, mostly due to the fact that your apartment is very hot. That's true. No, you're right. You're right that you're absolutely correct. And recently I've bit the bullet and I've been using the air conditioner more despite what will be a heightened electricity bill. And it's not it's worth it not only from more relative coolness in my sleep, but also in the white noise that drones out the bar next to my apartment. So you got new Wi-Fi and you just decided I have to turn off the AC like that's how the costs work. You're like, well, I have to sacrifice something. Hey man, entrepreneurs got to pinch pennies. You got to you got to save costs where you can. I think I know where you're going with this nickname for this week's guest though. Yeah, you like that cuz we I are think... jumping back into what was previously referred to as our e-commerce blitz with this guest. The blitz. The blitz. <laughs> <laughs> yes. E-commerce and retail blitz version 2.0. Today we are talking with Allie Trutman. I hope I'm saying her last name correctly. She's the president and CEO of Wicked Sheets. Wicked Sheets provides moisture wicking and cooling sleep products for people suffering from night sweats and hot flashes. And I see what you're doing there. Yes, actually, I hadn't even put this together in my own head. Probably something that I could use given that I run pretty hot. Speaking of hot, any hot takes in the research you did on Wicked Sheets? Absolutely. Wicked Sheets, founded in 2008, it seems to me a lot of their startup activity and their traction and getting into the market really started several years later, beginning in 2012, and then really seeming to pick up in 2015. And here we are, 2018. It would, on its surface, seem to be a much older company than we usually have on the pod, but I don't believe it was a full-time focus for Allie for a while. And so interested to hear what her journey has been. It's obviously been over time, but it seems like right now, Wicked Sheets is really starting to hit their stride a little bit. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that when we had Set Scouter on, that was the oldest company we had had on Upside to date. This is almost four years older than that. So one of the things about companies outside of Silicon Valley that we found is they're structured differently. So a startup can still be a startup almost 10 years later because of just different, a lot of it has to do with access to capital, as we've discussed before. There's just a different path for some businesses. Yeah, and I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that there was a significant period of time in terms of developing the product and getting it into a place where it could be sold. Through my research, first of all, Wicked Sheets is based in Louisville, Kentucky, our third company in Louisville. They've raised over a million dollars in funding thus far and looks to be raising again soon. They've been on QVC several times this year, but it seems that their their first year really in market was in 2013 when they sold their first 500 sets of bed sheets. And who do you think their audience is here? It seems to me that their audience are individuals who run hot the way I do and seem to sweat when they sleep. It also seems that there's a significant portion of their audience that are postmenopausal women with hot flashes. Yeah, I got that same feeling because the opening line is 
comfort sleep solutions for night sweats and hot flashes, which sounds to me like they have two markets, right? People who run hot and people who have hot flashes. I'm curious how big that market size is. Same. There was actually, and this is kind of an aside, in the research, I found one article from Louisville, from the Louisville area in 2016, I believe, talking about Wicked Sheets being part of the Academy Awards in the gift giving section of the Academy Awards. They were providing some of their products to celebrities. And this article specifically called out some celebrities that they thought were postmenopausal and in this stage of life. And it was like such a interesting, different aspect of a news article that I've ever read. <laughs> um, but, you know, I so recently I bought new bed sheets, bought them on Amazon and did that based on thread count. But I did look at the coolness factor and wicked sheets here from what I can find because they are a polyester. They don't actually have a thread count, but it was estimated to be equivalent to a 600 to 700 thread count sheet. And my bed sheets are 1800. So to me, that sounds like a significant difference, and I'm interested to hear what that experience is like. Speaking of differences, I'd like to hear a little bit more about the differences between the competitors in this space, because there are a ton of people who make sheets and Wicked Sheets. Did you find anything on competitors? Only that, you know, they're selling on Amazon, they're selling on QVC. There are a ton of other brands of bed sheets to buy on Amazon, some of them arguing that they are the softest, some of them that are moisture, moisture wicking and keep you cool. So I'm actually really interested to have this discussion about the competitive landscape specifically, because if you look at Amazon, Wicked Sheets is priced significantly higher than just about any other brand that I found. And so I'm interested to hear what they think their major differentiation is and that can justify that cost difference. But there must be something because in 2015, they jumped up from the 500 sets they sold in 2013 to 2,000 sets at $150 a piece. So in 2015, they're looking at around $300,000 in revenue. Interested to hear you know, how that has picked up this year since the Academy Awards, since being on QVC three times. I'm sure that we're going to hear a lot about explosive growth in this last year. QVC three times, I feel like that's a lot of times to be on QVC. I yeah. haven't even been on once. Not once, same. All right, you ready to jump in here and talk to Allie? Let's do it. Allie, welcome to the show. Hey guys, thanks for having me. Allie, we like to start with a history of the founder and getting a sense of kind of where you came from. So could you tell us about the history of Allie? Yeah, so I grew up in a very small town in Southern Illinois, so I am truly a Midwestern girl. My town was teeny tiny, had 11 kids in my grade school class. Basically, Smithen was known for hog farming and traditional jobs. Everybody basically woke up and went to work in St. Louis because that was the only big city near us. So I actually grew up playing soccer. That was kind of my outlet. And soccer brought me to Louisville, Kentucky, which is where I founded Wicked Sheets. But I've now been in Louisville for 16 years. And I loved that Louisville was a kind of an amalgamation of all these Midwestern towns with Southern charm. It was like a melting pot, basically, of all these uh, towns where people landed and there was Southern charm and it was like so welcoming. So I played soccer and while I was playing soccer, I got a psychology degree. A lot of people don't know this about me, but I actually was a, I'm a trained, classically trained child psychologist. I went to school to be a therapist for kids with autism, Asperger's and ADHD. And I was really interested in helping them behaviorally they have, you know, some challenges with fine and gross motor skills. So I took my athletic background from soccer and my passion for helping people um, overcome things in psychology and became a child psychologist before I started Wicked Sheets. What was the impetus behind being a child psychologist? Like, where was the driver? Yeah. So um, I grew up, again, like that small town mentality. I started babysitting when I was 10 years old, right? So a lot of people don't start babysitting until they're 15, 16. But our neighborhood, you know, everybody lived in my on my street that went to school with me. So I'd wake up, get my brother ready for school. And he's my older brother. So that's pretty telling. <laughs> then I would go next door and get the two little kids next door ready for school. We'd ride our bikes together. We'd go to class. And I just I just loved being around kids. I just I was always drawn to look at how they're learning, look at them play. And I'm still a big kid myself. And so I knew I was interested in a field in, with children, but then I had a psychology class when I was in high school 
it helped that my psychology teacher in high school was a really good looking guy that played soccer. So I fell in love with just the, the theories behind helping people and that you can change behavior and you can change things around you by using these tools, you know, called therapy or dream analysis. And I was just enamored by it. So I found myself in an internship in college where I was working with kids with autism. And I kid you not, this is such a strange way to get fascinated by autism, but I went on my first visit with a child with autism and she spit in my face. And I thought, this is going to be the most challenging career of my life. I'm totally in. I'm like, what do you, what do you do? And on your first day in the job, you get spit in the face and you have like, you can't react to that. You just have to go with the flow. So I thought, well, this is a challenge. Let's do it. <laughs> There's got to be a metaphor for entrepreneurship in there somewhere. <laughs> oh my gosh. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I always talk about entrepreneurship is, or at least the startup grind is running up a down escalator. And I think a day in the life of a therapist is like you running up full speed, a down escalator. So. I love that. I'm going to appropriate that phrase myself. <laughs> thank it's you. For, good. It's thank great. you for that. <laughs> I wanted to backtrack a little bit. So it sounds like you played soccer collegiately at the University of Louisville. Is that correct? Actually at a little division two school at Bellarmine University. Although we did play the University of Louisville um, in a lot of our exposition games, but you know, I actually, I was torn. I was going to play Division One at DePaul in Chicago. And uh, we showed up for my interview and the coach said, love what you're doing. You'll be the first person off the bench. And I am such a, a performer and a competitor that I was like, well, I don't want to go to a school where I'm the first person off the bench. I want to be the first person on the field. And so I interviewed with Bellarmine and my parents were really pleased because they said, not only will you be an athlete, but you'll also get an education while you're here. So Division two athletics um, was great. I played 77 out of 78 games. There was a little red card in there that I had to sit out one game. <laughs> <laughs> and I got to be a student at the same time, got to do all those traditional student things. So it was really a good fit for me. And now what I went you, to the University of Louisville for graduate school, though. What did you do to deserve the red card? Well, I'm so embarrassed to say this. Um, I was on a breakaway, and uh, the defender came up, cleats up, slid tackled me. And while she was down on the ground, I reached down and picked her up by her shirt and punched her in the face. Said, <laughs> oh, wow. Said, there's, a, there's gotta words. be a metaphor in there too. <laughs> I mean, it was not one of my finer moments. I looked at my coach and he had this look on his face and I didn't even wait to get the red card. I literally just walked off the field and walked straight to the bus. I knew I was getting the card and I thought, this is it. This is my moment. I just really crossed over to the other side, but we were down. No, actually, I think we were tied zero, zero. There are five minutes left. I was on a breakaway. I thought in my head, I'm like, here we go. I'm going to score. It's going to be the end of the game. This will be great. And she came in, she had kind of been messing with me the entire game and the ref just wasn't calling it. My coach wasn't taking me out. And he just looked at me and he was like, trut. That was what they called me. Trut, get a goal. And so I thought I was going to get it in my head. I'm like, oh, we're going to win. We're going to win. Going away from me. It just went straight to my fist and I executed. That's, that's an amazing story. Like, I wasn't expecting punch in the face when I asked that question. I'll just be honest there. <laughs> so I don't you mentioned, look like a bully. <laughs> no, you don't. You mentioned earlier that you went to grad school at Louisville. What was, what was that for? Was that still in the psychology field or did you transition? Yeah, that was still in the psychology field. So once I graduated from Bellarmine, I knew I was going to be in um, what we call human services. So I wanted to work directly with people. But at that point, you can decide, do you want to go into counseling and be a therapist where someone comes into your office and uh, lays on the couch and you work through problems? I knew I wanted to do behavioral and health assessments um, with patients. And so when I got to the University of Louisville, I got to work in a lab and actually like, you know, measure uh, cortisol levels in spit. I got to do one-on-one -on -one where we were doing behavior modification with children in school systems. And so I got to do the hands-on type of behavioral assessments at graduate school, which I just loved. I absolutely loved that I could be interactive with people. Can you work me through the timeline here, what year we're talking about when you're in grad school? Yeah, so um, I went to Bellarmine from 02 to 06. I went directly to graduate school. And my program, I could have finished in a year and a half with my master's, but I ended up doing a TA position. So I taught intro to psychology in like this massive stadium classroom to 400 students. Most of them didn't want to be there. 
and that was miserable, but I, but I loved the lab portion of that. So I actually stayed an extra year and worked on another project and got published. We were assessing cortisol levels in students around exam time. So I got to be in the lab and work with the psychology and the sciences and did some work there and then went straight back to Bellarmine and got my certificate in personal training and medical fitness. So I was working with kids with autism and doing personal training at the same time. So that was 2009. Talk to me about balancing being a student athlete with being a student. Was that challenging for you at all? You know, I'm someone that would consider myself um, self-diagnosed ADD, which I think a lot of entrepreneurs have this uh, beautiful skill set is what I like to call it because it really does help. And being a student athlete, I actually performed better in the classroom when I had a full load of soccer. And I probably performed better on the field when I had a full load of other extracurriculars that I had to balance. And I think that just really drives focus. So I had to focus when I was on the field, get that job done. And then I could switch gears. And then you have to focus in the classroom because being a student athlete, I had to maintain a 3-5 to be in good standing with my coach. And then I had to maintain a 3-5 with my parents in order for them to keep paying for my college tuition. So I didn't have the luxury of being able to get a job outside of school and sports. So I worked on campus for beer money. I even was really honest with my parents. I'm like, I'm pretty much just doing this phone job to get beer money. But it also taught me that I had to be balanced and focused when I was doing that as well. So I loved the challenge. And I think that speaks just going back to my self-diagnosis of ADD. I loved having a few things going on at the same time. And so if I'm looking at the timeline here correctly, so you got you went back to Bellarmine and got your certificate in 2009. Mm-hmm. Our, our research showed the beginning of Wicked Sheets at 2008. Yes. So can you help me tie in the timeline of starting Wicked Sheets with this time that you were at Bellarmine? Absolutely. So I go through my four years of collegiate soccer and I don't get injured, well, significantly injured one time, right? Then I graduate and I go start playing indoor soccer with the boys. And these, you know, the the girls and boys we were playing with at the time are all ages. So you have some washed up people that show up ready to relive the glory days. And you have some folks like me that are like, I just want to stay fit. And of course, it goes back to we drank beer after the game. It was great. So I was playing indoor post-graduation. And in 2007, late 2007, that summer, I went into a game and had a breakaway. Everything ends in a breakaway for me had a breakaway and the goalie came out and swept my legs and I tore my ACL. Um, So that was the end of 2007. And I did about three to four weeks of rehab before I had my total reconstruction on my knee. So I had torn my ACL. I had uh, messed up my meniscus. They had to go in and clean up some scar tissue. And so 2008, I am finding myself not playing soccer, completely bedridden, learning to walk again, because I opted for the surgery where they took my own tissue versus cadaver. So my rehabilitation took quite some time. In that time, I was really, really depressed, basically, because I wasn't exercising like normal. And I was bedridden, not being able to walk, not being able to cycle, all that stuff. And I had always noticed that when I was playing sports, I had night sweats. But I could make sense of the night sweats when you're exercising three times a day or, you know, or running around like a chicken with your head cut off. And when I was bedridden, I couldn't figure out why I was sweating so much. And so once I got back to it, I started thinking about why the heck do I have these night sweats? So like most women do, we're more clinically diagnosed with things. I went to my doctor and she's like, well, Allie, you know, you don't have menopause. You're not on medication. You don't have cancer. All these things that would typically make someone sweat. You just don't have them. So this was kind of the buzz time period when hyperhidrosis was being diagnosed. And this is folks that have excessive sweating for no medical reason. Some folks get it in their palms. Some people have it on their feet. Some people get it in their groin. I I feel terrible for those people. But mine just so happened to come in the form of night sweats. So my body would shut down at night and in bed, I would sweat profusely, whether it was uh, me alleviating my stress or that was just my metabolism on overdrive. Mine just came in the form of night sweats. So I was doing this whole child psychology thing, traveled back to St. Louis for Easter brunch in 2008 and told my parents this thing that I had hyperhidrosis and my whole family around the Easter brunch table is like, oh my God, I sweat a ton too. So you kind of start putting the dots together and saying, well, this is genetic, this sucks. And my cousin was pregnant at the time. And she said, well, I hate to tell you, sister, it doesn't get better when you get pregnant. 
And so I'm joking around with her. I'm like, oh my God, my life is going to suck from here on out. If I have this thing called hyperhidrosis, I'm going to be disgusting my whole life. And at that moment, her husband walked past us and he was wearing a Nike dry fit golf shirt. And I just jokingly suggested that he was going to come home one day and we were going to be in his closet, cutting up his golf shirt, sewing him into bed sheets so we could finally sleep cool and dry. So it started in 2008 and I traveled back from St. Louis to Louisville. That whole drive back, I filled up a notebook on how I was going to abandon my career of child psychology and start a sweaty bed sheets company. And so I didn't end up leaving child psychology for a couple of years, but pretty shortly thereafter, I think about six to seven weeks later, I had figured out a way to get the fabric and sew it into bed sheets. And I was sleeping on my first set of wicked sheets six or seven weeks after that initial conversation. And what was that experience like? How was the first run of this first version of wicked sheets for you? Well, I experienced a lot of challenges because, you know, I I went to school for 10 years to be a child psychologist. I had one business class. And so really understanding the economics was difficult for me. But the other big part of it was I didn't know how to sew. So I literally was like, well, I've got this idea. I could definitely cut up shirts and sew them into bed sheets, but someone else is going to have to sew them for me. So I found myself going on Craigslist to find sewers. I was meeting with people all over town who had started businesses to try and really help me understand the landscape of, I've got this idea. What do I need to do with it now? And I was a little bit risk averse early on. Now I'd say I'm pretty significant risk taker, but I met with attorneys first off just to make sure that I wasn't doing something that was going to put me in jail or like infringing on someone's idea. And so it was really challenging, but the blessing of living in Louisville and having this like Southern charm is there are tons of quilters, there are groups around town. So I just got on Craigslist and found a group of ladies that I interviewed who knew how to sew and they helped me walk through those first prototype iterations that we had. But I slept on my, on my sheets my first night and they really worked. And I was like, oh, I think I'm onto something. <laughs> wow. So you mentioned something. You mentioned that you, it took you a couple years to really decide to dive all in and get out of the child psychology field. We hear that a lot with people kind of like dabbling on almost like a side project until they feel like there's enough momentum to switch over. So can you talk about those couple of years as you were hiring quilters to sew your own bed sheets for you? And then what was the kind of tipping point that got you to go into this more aggressively? Sure. So I think there are two really poignant things that happened. One, I basically this financially. So I took my, you know, the $10,000 I had on a down that I was going to put on a down payment on a a home and said, well, this is going to be used to purchase fabric from here on out. So I stayed in my one bedroom apartment and for about two years, just bootstrapped it, you know, took 5,000 bucks for my parents, 5,000 bucks for my brother. Basically, I said he owed me for taking him to school all those years. <laughs> uh, so I didn't have to trade equity. I was just, you know, getting paid back. So two years went by of just really, I'm working at four o'clock in the morning, doing personal training, get home, work on the business at nine, get done at three, go do therapy, then do another bit of personal training until 9 p.m., come back, work on the business. And at this point, I was basically, uh, I had moved all the furniture out of my living room in this said one bedroom apartment and was rolling these rolls of fabric onto the floor. I had volleyball knee pads on, had a little tool belt on. I was cutting the fabric myself into the patterns. And I was like, oh, this is easy when you're 24. You can go on two hours of sleep and be totally fine. But I was physically exerting myself doing personal training because I would work out with all my clients. And then I was physically exerting myself when I would do three hour therapy sessions with kids with autism who require piggyback rides and tickles and data keeping and driving to and from. And I was kind of hitting a wall of my body cannot take this anymore. And so I found myself at a a Bellarmine uh, University alumni function where I met a woman who had just gone through a cancer treatment. And as a result of the cancer treatment, she ended up having an early hysterectomy. And she said, this, this, caused me to go into early menopause. She said, if I would have had your sheets when I was going through this, I think my rehabilitation would have been better. So I'm sitting there like crying with this woman thinking like, God, if I could have just started this sooner, maybe I could have helped more people. So my like little psychology heart was like, oh, I just want to help people. And at that same moment, her husband walked up and he was like, I don't know what you're selling, but I'm buying. How much money do you need to get this thing off the ground? And I, I get chills. I'm literally getting chills talking about it. I was so fortunate in that moment that this guy was like, I believe in whatever you've got going on. 
let's figure out how much we'll help. And he said, help get you off your knees and get you working on the company instead of working in the company. And at that moment, I had like this lightning of, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to take the plunge. I'm going to do this full time. And so we worked together. I got my first investment from him. It was $75,000. And with that 75 K we, we took everything from Louisville, Kentucky, and actually brought the whole operation down to North Carolina, which is a really, again, it'll give me chills. It's a really good fit because this particular group called LS Solutions was hiring adults with disabilities, adults with autism to work in their fulfillment center. And I thought, if I'm leaving my career as a psychologist in the field of autism, it's got to be, it's, I've got to have a sign, right? And then you hear that these folks are hiring adults with autism. And I was just like, all right, let's do it. So we loaded up a U-Haul and drove down to North Carolina, the craziest drive, seven hours, dropped off everything, built up competencies with them, you know, did some some uh, work with them. And then I left and went back to Louisville and I'm like, oh my God, this is the first time it's really going to be in someone else's hands. Now I just have to work on selling the snot out of these things to keep all these people busy. So there was that moment. And then the health insurance moment when I knew like, if I can afford health insurance, pay myself enough to afford health insurance, I can pretty much leave these other jobs. And what year was that? That was 2011 that Don came on. And so for the first two years, it was bootstraps, me on the floor in my one bedroom apartment, driving all over Louisville, getting sewers to do this. And then it took us about six months to find a U.S. manufacturer. So that was really, really challenging. So 2011, we call ourselves or we say that's the first year that we were an e-commerce business. That was when we started using PayPal and all that stuff online. So. So I think now would be a good time to introduce what is Wicked Sheets and what's the problem it's solving? Right. So Wicked Sheets are comfort sleep solutions for folks suffering from night sweats and hot flashes. So what started out as a solution to help people that are sweaty like myself or folks that I thought were high performance athletes actually started addressing a much larger market and that's menopausal women. So folks that are having hot flashes as well. So some people sweat a lot. Some people just overheat at night and don't produce a lot of sweat. So Wicked Sheets wick away six times more moisture than traditional bedding. And when we say traditional, we mean cotton typically. They dry four times faster. They're two to three degrees cooler to the touch uh, right now all night long. So there's that cooling piece for the folks that don't necessarily produce a ton of sweat. And um, the thing that I was really wanting to address is a lot of the folks that we, the customers that we sell to have compromised immune systems as a result of a condition. So cancer, they are going through chemo treatments, diabetes, they have sensitive immune systems. So I wanted to make sure that this was hypoallergenic as well. So we worked really, really hard on being, we were actually the world's first performance knit certified by the Asthma Allergy Foundation. So it's hypoallergenic and we can control the things that are going into our sheets that are going to help our sleepers sleep better. So help me understand, like, how is this like such a amazing or competitive advantage. What is like the secret sauce here? What's the fabric that you stumbled upon in six to seven weeks that just, that was like, oh, I'm onto something. Growing up in soccer clothes and exercise clothes, I knew that it needed to be some version of Under Armour or Nike Dry Fit or Adidas Climacool. And so the first thing, the first rolls of fabric that I was buying were actually from Portland, Oregon, and they were just discontinued colors of these large retailers. So they were discontinued orange from Under Armour. It was a discontinued checkered pattern from Nike. A lot of stuff that was going into either yoga clothes or golf shirts, or I don't think I had any shorts, but some t-shirts and things like that. So I knew the technology existed, but when we found out that there were super talented fabric engineers in Japan, I went, or I'm sorry, not Japan, Taiwan. I went straight to Alibaba, figured out who is a competent source of fabric. And I actually found myself with um, swimming suit manufacturers. So I wanted to find hydrophobic and hydrophilic fabrics that would not take that moisture and make it go down to the mattress. So what, when you think about a running shirt, you're running and the sweat isn't like coming down. It's pulling it away from your body, beating out on the other side. It's being absorbed into the fabric itself. And so we had to do a ton of research on what's the fiber component that does that, what's the pore size that leads to the good breathability and leads to clean air coming in and out of your bed. Because a lot of people who sweat say the oils on my body are produced and my bed stinks. So what can we use to neutralize the pH? What can we do 
to make sure that this is hypoallergenic and has no harmful chemicals that are going to hurt a baby if the baby sleeps in bed with you. So we did, I'd say a good solid two, one to two years on perfecting this fabric. And now we are, we're still perfecting the fabric. Now we're working one-on-one with this group in Taiwan and they help us figure out, all right, Allie, what's the new spec you want to add to the sheet? And then we go through trials, iterations, and R&D. So we're actually going to re- release another fabric probably um, in six months that we've been working on for the past eight months. So we're just always working to perfect it, just like Under Armour is always working to perfect the perfect t-shirt. I kind of want to get in the weeds here because I've thought about this a lot and I've just always been curious. How does moisture wicking work? Whether it's a t-shirt or bed sheets, like how does that work? Yeah. So fibers and the way that these fibers are woven, woven or knitted, we use a knitted uh, fabric. So basically the way that they are constructed in the bed, it's such that where you're sleeping or where you're sweating on this thing, it will pull the moisture away from your body. So wick just means absorb and it'll travel out to the dry surface areas of the bed. So when you say the sweat or moisture is evaporating, it actually is evaporating as it travels through that fiber construction. So it is all about how these fibers are either knitted or woven. And then when you mess with pore size, you can actually change how much oxygen can be exposed to the moisture and then it dries even faster. So there's lots of different technology out there. We just seem to find one that really worked. We've tested it against cotton. We've tested it against our competitors. So we know that when this is going out to a sleeper or a customer that we have, it it scientifically is proven to work. It's just now a question of, do you like the feel? Do you like the fit on your bed? Does the color match? So you have all these other traditional bedding things that you have to think about. But really, I love getting in the weeds on the science and the technology because my science brain was so drawn to, well, if you can make science do it, the data doesn't lie. And so that's what I love. I can stand behind a product that I know the data points say this is actually going to work. Now, if it doesn't match your comforter, that's just not something I can fix right now. (laughs) Okay, second nerdy science question then. How do you test that and compare that to other types of bed sheets? Like what's the testing process look like? Well, there's a there's like the testing behemoth called Intertech testing. And you everybody, like when we got on QVC, we had to send it there. And there are intertech offices throughout the world, and there's a very standardized form that they have to check off, right? Does the seam strength test or measure correctly? How hard can you pull it before there's a hole in it? How much moisture will it absorb? Is there formaldehyde in it? So there's like a, a, a generic checklist that the massive testing facilities have to check off. And then we work with a, a company in the United States called Text Test, and you can send them any sort of fabric, and they'll do performance testing. So they'll do flammability testing. They'll say, here's how much bleach you can pour on it before the wicking ability decreases. For us, we're really interested in what goes onto your sheets. So we have them test urine and feces and all the good stuff that your body produces. (laughs) I'll let your imagination go there and see how it responds to it. And so we use that. And then we can also send those test results to our international partners and just make sure I mean, we, we test the snot out of these things. Um, just make sure it is going to wick it away and does like the gross stuff that's in sweat. So my favorite conversation to have is it loves electrolytes and it loves sea bum <laughs> and it loves potassium chloride and it loves the stinky stuff that's in your head oil. It's just gross, but they make synthetic forms of all that stuff to put it to the test. Yeah, it sounds like you test the snot into this stuff. <laughs> Yeah. And our baby line, we actually were like, okay, they're going to drool. They're going to like have all the nasty boogers all over it. Let's see if we can wick it away. Never uh, was... in my life did I think I was going to be that person. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, that was such a bad joke. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. I know. I think um, I just like walked you into that. Like, okay. <laughs> so we left your story in 2011 and we kind of talked about the two years of getting that fabric Right. So between 2013, 2014, and now it's 2018, that's a lot of time has elapsed. What has been kind of the big pushes? Has it been marketing? Has it been like, what has been the the focus in addition to iterating on your fabrics? Sure. Well, the unwanted focus was manufacturing, something that we did when we said we want to go large and go to either a mass retailer. We know we need to grow. And in doing so, it's going to be a recurring wholesaler agreement, right? 
So I looked at it from the perspective of, I love the B2C sales and I want to focus really heavily on B2C e-commerce. I don't want to go into retailers. I don't want to go bricks and mortar. I want to focus on growing the business organically for the B2C crowd. And then we also had these opportunities like, where do we want to move next and where's our customer base? And so I actually flew out to Silicon Valley and did a pitch competition. I know this is the the funny part of the podcast, right? Outside of Silicon Valley, I flew to Silicon Valley for a pitch competition called the American Dreams Entrepreneur Series. And I was terrified. I actually had just read the Elon Musk book, which is so fitting because he's exploding right now too. And I was like, I'm going to go on my like entrepreneurial mecca journey. And if, if I do this pitch and nail it, the company is going to go gangbusters after this. If it goes poor and I totally the bed, then I'm going to say, all right, it was a great couple of years. I'm not going to be able to get funding after this. We, we got to grow this year. Like that was uh, 2013, 2014. So I had just finished a launch it program basically for 10 week program for non-business majors. And I felt really confident that I had finally figured out my financials. I had finally figured out our roadmap, you know, business canvas, all that stuff. So I felt really confident in that same time frame. I bought out my original investor, got two new guys on board, had gone to a menopause convention, really understood that the menopausal audience and these physicians who were so tired of prescribing drugs to people for various things, and it was causing night sweats or hot flashes. We had gotten them on board. I'm like, well, the next thing is you got to, you got to see if you can get on home shopping network. QVC, where that menopausal customer is. So I go out, do my Elon Musk thing. I ended up drawing the short straw. I was like the last pitcher on the last day. And I walked in to, um, I think it was an Xfinity store where they were doing it. And there were cameras everywhere. And Mark Zuckerberg's sister, Randy Zuckerberg, was actually the, the woman that I was pitching to and the VP of Home Shopping Network. I felt so completely intimidated. Midwestern girl from Louisville, Kentucky, walking in. And all these people that were before me were wearing Christian Louboutin shoes. They had tea that would make you lose 20 pounds in like four days. And I thought, no way I'm going to make it. No way. <laughs> so I kind of had like a little alley moment. I'm like, positive self-talk here. You're just going to leave it all on the table. And they said in the pitch, they're like, it's you have three minutes. Don't go next to the table. You're not going to talk to them directly. You're just going to pitch and then walk off the stage. Well, I knew something was going right because I think we were like 21 minutes into the pitch and they were like, Allie, come here, let's feel it. And I'm like shaking their hands at this point. And I'm like, oh my God, I think they like me. Like, I really think they like me and they like the product. But I think what they liked was it was a product that solved a modern problem. Like I always say, it's like the a, a new age solution to the age old problem of sweating. They liked that it was addressing a problem that not just menopausal women had, but their husbands had and they're pregnant. And so I thought, this this is it. This is my shining moment. So we ended up winning that pitch competition, which was great. And that was, uh, they were promising me a slot on the Home Shopping Network. And so you get, you get like an email from her team. And then you get an email from the HSN team. And nothing's traditional. There's really bad communication. Well, I kept thinking, like having these head stretching moments, like what is going on? Come to find out. Home Shopping Network was in the process of being bought by QVC and the Curate Group. And so my airing, my showing actually got totally put on the back burner. And they were like, it's not going to work with us. The day that I was supposed to go on is when they announced that QVC was buying them. And so I I spent all this time, $300,000 building inventory. And I then had to go to my investors and say, well, all the money I just raised for the company that I was going to use on salaries. I spent on inventory and now the opportunity is gone. And I, I just think, oh my God, this is, I just basically burned the company. And this was 2014? This is actually more recent. That was 2016. I think that was 2016. So I'm trying to take you through very quickly from yeah. 2013 up yeah. until now. So I ended up getting in touch with a woman from Louisville who actually was on QVC. And she said, well, why don't you just talk to my reps and see if it's a good fit for QVC? If you've already been through the song and dance for the home shopping network, and now they're owned by the same company, let's see what we can do for you. And so I started talking to them. They put me in touch with a buyer. And shortly thereafter, I was flying out to Philadelphia, pitching the buyers. Shortly thereafter, I had a purchase order in hand. We 
spent about 14 months prepping for all of this stuff. We moved our manufacturing from Cincinnati to China for our wholesale orders. And I was just on in June for our first airing on QVC. And it was, it went really well. Now I've been on four times, so it's good. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, there's, there's lots of kind of backtracking cover there, but while we're on this note, so you've been on QVC four times in the last year? Four times in the last month and a half. Wow. Okay. And so what, what does that look like when you go on QVC? What does that like kind of tactically mean? So QVC is a live airing. And so they basically are putting me out in front of their viewership, which is, I think on a good day, it's 96 million homes. The thing that they agreed with, with me was my target audience has always been the target chopper of a QVC profile. So it was a really easy sale to make to them to say, listen, I've already been marketing to this the home buyer who buys the linens for the family. And she's looking for things that are going to improve her life and make her life and a uh, lifestyle better. And if that means buying it for herself or buying it for her husband, they're really looking for solutions. And QVC does a great job of going through a very stringent process and making sure that whatever they put on their show is going to help that person. So going on live with them is daunting, but now we are looking for these recurring wholesale agreements to help us grow top line revenue, which will make us look like a really strong company that has uh, addressed some really good channel partners and also is focusing on B2C, growing that revenue, allowing us to go out and actually have some serious discussions with investors in the future. So I'm sure we're going to have to do a series B sometime in the next six to nine months and really focus on putting more money into salaries, putting more money into marketing, and then everything left over goes right into inventory. How big is your team right now? I say we're a team of 11, but not everybody's in the office. We're like the the traditional e-com startup. We've got four people in Cincinnati helping us. We've got six people in Louisville. Three of them are in the office. And we've got our uh, engineer in Asia that we work with constantly. So I say we're about a team of 11, but everybody's kind of doing their own thing. And what channels do you sell through right now? You have QVC, you probably have your own website. I think you're on, or I know you're on Amazon. What's your channel strategy in that way? We actually are also on house.com, slumbersome.com, brookstone.com, a few other like smaller specialty retailers that we're doing a lot of tests and measurements with that. So understanding is someone that's looking for a sleep product going to go to a sleep website or are they going to go to a very, very traditional website like Amazon and look for us? And we're testing a lot of keywords and in, in that the thing that's funny and interesting with resellers is when we partnered with Brookstone a couple of years ago, I was like, yeah, let's use the Brookstone name for some customer validation. If they see us listed on Amazon, this is great. Well, no offense to Brookstone, but they've declared bankruptcy four times in the last like five years. And I can totally understand why. The other day I'm searching Wicked Sheets like I usually once a week say, let me look on Wicked Sheets and what pops up. You know, if we have to send cease and desist letters, who's the new competition? Well, there's Wicked Sheets on Walmart.com and we didn't put our listing up there. Come to find out, Brookstone had listed us on Walmart.com. That is not our target customer. So I had to reach out to them and I've had 11 buyers since we started with them. I had to reach out their chain of command. No one knew about it. Everyone's like, oh, sorry, that shouldn't have happened. And then it takes a couple of days to take everything down. So we have to be really, really cautious with who we partner with and make sure that I've read all the fine print that we don't end up on a website that isn't necessarily for our target customer. You know, we're vigilant on price points and, and what this customer is looking for. So I was going to touch on the price point front, because Mm -hmm. I think I've heard in the past that when you go on QVC, often they will have a price point they almost kind of put on you, which may be different from where you're selling elsewhere online. Is, is that true? Is that something you've experienced? What's that look like? That is exactly true. And it was something we knew and I had a a discussion with the board and the investors. I said, this is our first go at it. I'm not sure what to expect, right? I know what I'm selling it to them for, but what they're offering it to their customer for, I have no control over that. So we just have to be, basically we have to play defense and say, we have to be okay with losing some sales uh, that would traditionally be on our.com or on Amazon. We have to be okay with that. Because the larger plan is QVC is a massive retailer. Now that they're owned by Q-Rate, they have partners with Zulily and Frontgate and Ballard Designs and Home Shopping Network. 
And if we really want to grow this organically B2C and organically within seller channels, we have to play the game. And that's just something we've seen with our competitors. Our, our number one competitor is Sheiks, and they very quickly went to Bed Bath & Beyond. And, you know, we're watching the things that they're experiencing. And I think we all understand that we have to work together for market validation and that there is a large problem out there that people want to sleep better. But we just all have to carve out our own niche in that respect. For us, we knew that going with QVC was going to be risky and it might be challenging, but all we're trying to do is shorten our learning curve so that we can get with another retailer or in a situation where we've learned from that and then we know what to expect for the next time. As you're going through this kind of hyper growth phase right now, it sounds like what are what are like the KPIs that you guys look at as a firm to say, okay, we're doing this right, we're doing this wrong, how can we do this better? Yeah, so interestingly enough, I just got back from Chicago. One of our investors, she's brilliant. She lives in Chicago. I just flew out there yesterday. We did a day marketing retreat and you know, what we've been doing traditionally has been very focused on that specific one customer. And so uh, we call her Sally. Everybody has their own persona. Sally has been the, the main driving, driver of my marketing efforts. And when we met on Friday, we wanted to totally spice it up. So looking at now we have all this data on her, you know, are we going to just pour kerosene on the persona of Sally and basically use our marketing dollars that we're going to invest, you know, three times this year on are we going to put it on the same trajectory that we have, or do we want to spice it up? Do we want to look at some other um, avenues that we've not been paying attention to? Because at the end of the day, everyone sleeps. Everyone benefits from a cooler sleep, a drier sleep, an uninterrupted sleep. So what are some opportunities there? And that's what I love about being an e-commerce business. We can build out these tests and put them to the test tomorrow. And I think we're going to find out some really interesting stuff. And I just don't want to ever limit us from our customer base. On the product front, something that I saw that you said, since you use this fabric that isn't measured in thread count, usually a lot of vetting, it has like some number of thread counts. So you have some measure of something. I don't even know what people really use that for other than I think I use it as a proxy for like how comfortable it is. Can you talk about what thread count means and what Wicked Sheets compares to? Yeah, absolutely. So thread count, uh, we like to say thread count is out, right? So we are a knitted fabric and knitted fabrics are actually one continuous loop of the same fiber. So it is knitted out of one fiber. Woven fabrics, which is where you come into thread count um, discussion, they actually use 400 counts of thread or 600 counts of thread. And typically, traditionally, the higher the number, the thinner the sheet is, and thus they think the softer the sheet is. Now with that, when you go with softness and you want to have a certain hand feel, as what they say in, in uh, the fiber and fabric world, you actually can limit yourself on the technology. So we went with a knitted fabric so that we could be more scientific with what we're trying to accomplish. So when you say, okay, what's your thread count, Wicked Sheets? Ours is a thread count of one, but it's comparable to the feel of a 700, 800 thread count because we use a silk weight fiber. So we can even control the silkiness and the weights of our yarn when we make and construct Wicked Sheets. It's really a fascinating process that goes back to when people were weaving thing, things on looms, you know, in huts. This is this art of sewing goes so far back. And now we just use technology to innovate sewing. Then you can produce really cool high-tech fabrics. I want to ask a couple of finance-focused questions, um, some numbers questions. Your guys' cost to acquire someone, what's that like in your different channels, B2C and we'll go QVC as your two majors? So cost to uh, acquire our customers, we work on this all the time. Mm -hmm. It's different for every single channel, right? So I always take Amazon as a great example because I pay a monthly fee to be on Amazon. I pay a per transaction fee to be on Amazon. And if like QVC is going on, for instance, right now we're running a sale because we want to have some competitive pricing. So our cost of customer daily, especially when we've got all these other resellers that are uh, advertising us. And we have to make sure that we are not losing sales and, and going under basically trying to win a sale over. So for me, it makes sense. If you're going to buy from qvc.com, I think you should buy from qvc.com. All my end game is, is to get you sleeping on Wicked Sheets. I want you sleeping on Wicked Sheets. So whether you bought it from wickedsheets.com, from QVC, from Amazon. I think what draws them to my website as the second purchase, which we know our customer will typically sleep on them and six to seven weeks later buy their second set because they're like, 
ooh, now when I take them off the bed, I don't want to wash them and have to put my old sheets back on. I want another set of Wicked Sheets. So I want basically them to buy their second set off of wickedsheets.com, which is obviously a much less cost of acquisition. So from that, getting them onto our website, you also have to think about Facebook ads, Google AdWords. What is the top bubble that I'm paying to get eyeballs on me? And then then they go into my funnel and how much money am I losing at every single stage of the funnel? <laughs> so from a really high level, it's expensive to get them onto my website. I don't make as much money, obviously, when they're buying from another reseller, but I know that that's a vital and important part of this step or process in buying because the second purchase is going to be from me where I make more money. How about the third purchase? How often are customers purchasing a third set of sheets? So the third set is usually a gift, which I love. So the third, it goes one to me. I love it. I don't want to sleep on cotton anymore. I now need to have another set in my rotation. Sally's friend, Kathy, just got diagnosed with cancer. and Now she's going through chemo. So the third set is going to be for my friend. And then she loops her into that, into our, um, you know, buying procedure or my daughter's pregnant and she's complaining of night sweats. So we know that that third set is a gift and a conversation. So we want to make sure that we're talking to them and staying top of mind with them when another new life experience happens. And what percent of customers are repeating, like repeat buying? Uh, I think last year we were at 28%. I'm really proud. We have like a 2.8. 3% return rate and typical home furnishings is 15%. So uh-huh. we are historically low return rate and high repeat customer rate. What does the awareness or education process look like for getting people to understand the differences between your fabric and cotton and why they should try? So I think the education piece actually has um, one of our competitive advantages and something we've tried really hard to, to differentiate or use as a differentiator of ourselves and our competitors, we're really focused on the health aspects of it. And so typically a person finds us because they're searching night sweats and some medication, night sweats and some condition they're suffering from, or why am I hot when I'm sleeping at night? So I've been really, really focused on the healthcare aspects and talking to the customer about that. And then it's not even a question of why are these sheets better? It's oh, I didn't know I needed sheets when I was taking Wellbuterin for my uh, depression. Oh, I didn't know that changing this aspect of my bedroom might help me sleep better at night when I'm suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. So the education piece is not necessarily on why we're better. It's on, oh, I didn't know that I needed this um, in order to help me sleep better. Does that make sense? Totally makes sense. In our research, I found I found an article... I think it was with the Louisville Business Courier or something along those lines that was talking about your growth between the years of, I think it was 2013 and 2015, I'm looking now. Yeah, so you had mentioned that in 2013, you had sold around 500 sets, and in 2015, that was closer to 2,000. What's the last three years been like for you, or especially now that you've been on QVC? Are you seeing large growth from those figures? We are. The purchase order from QVC will obviously be a huge bump from us. But I think the really important thing with growth is the opportunities for someone that was sewing this out of North Carolina and Cincinnati at, you know, 25 units at a time. The larger purchase orders helps me manufacture a better product because we have efficiency models. Now we're doing the same thing over and over again. We decrease our error because we don't have to change threads and sizes and things. So I look at the number of sets we're producing, like, okay, so we'll do like 10,000 this year or something like that. It's better for me to actually manufacture more sheets. It makes us a better product because our efficiencies now have increased and we're not making uh, human errors as you do when you're handcrafting a product. So we don't have to change the threads as often. So I love mass manufacturing. You can actually build processes that work versus when you're working with smaller batches, you can see, you see a lot of increased errors. Can you talk about the the larger market size here? What is the end goal? What is the big opportunity for Wicked Sheets? We can look at that from, from two different perspectives, from the B2C perspective and the B2B perspective. B2C, I always like to use the example of, in the United States, there are 6,000 women entering menopause today. 85% of them are going to have hot flashes. 
most of these women are going to be waking up uncomfortable, whether they're sweating or not, or just because they're overheating at night. That is a huge opportunity for us. I think it's estimated that the menopause population is about a $12 billion uh, market. And within that, I think it's $2.6 billion are bed sheets and pillowcases. So that's just a huge opportunity on its own. When you talk about it from a B2B perspective and you're looking at the QVC shopper, she probably is close to menopausal age, but she could also be buying for her husband. She could be buying for her sister. She could be buying for her daughter. And I think you can see that opportunity and saying that we call this person the swayable shopaholic is going to buy it, love it, and then buy it for other people. So that channel we're focused on in B2C is just that menopausal woman. B2B opens up all these other doors for us and gets it in the hands of people. And I don't necessarily have to pinpoint menopause. I just have to be in front of the right person. I did want to ask, actually, if, if during your pitch in, in San Francisco, if you're wearing the Wicked Sheets helping sweaty people spoon since 2008 shirt. <laughs> I should have. Oh, my gosh. I absolutely should have worn this shirt. We made these for our 10-year brand anniversary party this year, and people love them. They were like, oh, my God. I, I thought, oh, they're funny. No one's going to wear it. It's just something the team could wear. And I had people calling and going, can you make that for me? I'm totally wearing it. <laughs> so that was great. But actually... It is widely known in all of my pitches. I can't wear sleeves because I, I will sweat through. I will pit out in front of people. And a lot of people laugh and they're like, well, that's so good. You're like totally selling it even more because you're legitimately sweating while you're talking about sweating. And I'm like, yeah, but then people start looking at your armpits and kind of forget about what you're talking about. So, <laughs> so my pitches are very prescribed, if you will. One of the last questions that I have here is... Talking about your decision to remain in Louisville and what Louisville has done for your business, has geography played a part in the viability or success of Wicked Sheets? I think it is 100% a key component of why Wicked Sheets is still working, right? So, and I don't necessarily have to say something equals success, but I'd say while we're, why we, we are still growing and the access that we've had has everything to do with this region that we're in. And some of it even goes back to the traditional ideals of we're producing a product that people have to sew that is handcrafted. And this area with this Southern draw, draw or charm, they have a lot of feels for sewing and producing things by hand. It's not to say that they're terrified by technology because I think this region actually is doing a great job of finding good tech, developing good tech, selling tech. But I think when you combine technology with like fabric technology and a lost art of sewing and you produce a tangible product that is a problem solution type of product, I think people will get behind it. And in Louisville, it just, I just have better access faster. In Louisville, we always say no one will turn you down for coffee. If I wanted to talk to the guys that sold Genscape for $148 million, I could literally have coffee with them tomorrow and they'd be like, how can I help? And then like flying to Chicago... This woman has done tremendous business. She's, by all means, I'm sure she's going to be in the billionaire list one day, opened up her home and said, let's meet and have coffee at my house and do a marketing session. You have access to people like that who really want to help. And it's not like, oh, I'm only going to do this because I now want 15% profits interest in your business. So I think that is a really poignant statement to e-commerce in the Midwest, in Louisville and the surrounding cities. Alia, is there anything that we didn't ask that we should have? Hmm. No, I think you guys are good. I love, I love talking. We got to do science. We got to do QVC. We got to do the customer. We talked about the background. I think it's great. I, I have one dangling question in the back of my mind. You started this by buying fabric from these clothing manufacturers that were using them as performance fabric for exercise, let's say. And now you've kind of diverged mm -hmm. and gone down the path of what people need when they sleep. Is there a future opportunity where this is kind of brought back to where it started and it's performance fabric that can be used as clothing or is that not practical? Oh, I've, I've had a dream that it becomes a wicked wear type of uh, situation. But as I mentioned, we watch our competitors very closely and our one competitor is dabbling in an athlete's line of sleepwear. And Tom Brady's actually doing a recovery t-shirt for sleepwear. So I, I think that there's a lot to be said for that, but 
since I have night sweats, I will say the last thing that I want on top of me when I'm sleeping are more layers. So you're going to get to hear the Allie likes to sleep close as close to in the buff as possible. I don't want more layers of anything on me. And then, you know, so you have clothes on, you have your underwear on or whatever, then you have a sheet, then you have a comforter, then you have a throw blanket or whatever. I am all for the sleep in as little clothing as possible and let the sheet wick away the moisture for you. And so I'd actually rather probably focus on building out a better pillow, a better mattress protector. Uh, We have a mattress right now that I think is far none in terms of breathability because a lot of the folks that we were, that were buying wicked, I just spent $7,000 on a memory foam mattress and it's making me sweat profusely. It's helping my back. But now I'm a sweaty beast at night. What can I do? And so we offer just buy one fitted sheet. You know, we call it like the millennial special. You can buy a a fitted sheet and two pillowcases and that's all. So I think I'd rather focus on sleep than sleep wear in terms of decreasing layers, increasing the breathability. Great. After the show, if people want to learn more about you or Wicked Sheets, where should they go? You can contact me anytime at wickedsheets.com. We have a contact button on there or follow us on Facebook at Wicked Sheets on Twitter and Instagram as well. And I always say people can email me anytime. And I always share my personal email address. It's Allie, A-L-L-I at wickedsheets.com. So I'm always hope to help anybody, especially if you're in soft goods manufacturing. Awesome. Well, thanks for being on the show, Allie. Thanks, guys. It was a blast. All right, Eric, we just spoke with Allie Trutman of Wicked Sheets. What are we about to do here in our third segment? Well, this third segment, which is what we call the verbal hypothetical deal memo, is Jay and I's favorite segment of the podcast. In it, we're going to talk through kind of what we learned in our research, what we learned from the founder, and just kind of our general feelings about the founder, the company, and the opportunity. And Jay, there's going to be four questions that we look at. What are those four questions? Yeah, generally here, we're trying to answer implicitly or explicitly the four questions. One, how committed is this founder? Two, what are the founder's chances of success in this business and in life? Three, what does winning look like in terms of revenue in my return as an investor? And four, why has this founder chosen this business? So Eric, along those lines, where do you want to start here? You want to start talking about Ally as a founder? I think we should start, I mean, we like starting with the founder, but when we look at one of those four questions, and we don't have to go through them line by line, but I think the easiest one to just kind of check off is why this founder picked this business. Do you agree? Very clear, yeah, which is a, is a, is a huge plus in my book, right? To have a founder who's scratching her own itch or wicking her own sweat wow, is nice. not bad, right? On yeah, that fly. was pretty good. On the fly. <laughs> I think is generally a positive sign for Allie as a founder. And I'm going to give my hot take. I had a great time talking with Allie. And there were a lot of things that stuck out to me as a good, dedicated, and hard-driving founder. I think it's something that we find with former athletes a lot, a certain level of discipline and dedication. And she was embarrassed to tell the story of her red card when she punched the player in the face that that took her down. <laughs> In a weird way, I was I was kind of into that. I was like, I think that's a, a positive in the long term that there's this level of passion evident in what she's doing. Maybe there's an argument to be made that there should be some restraint as well or some risk mitigation, but I think that's generally a positive sign for Ali as a founder. What did you think? Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think that, and kind of stepping back again, you talked about athletes as a whole. They have this kind of drive I think it's just intensity. Like there, that's kind of the same feeling I get is when they go into something, there's a lot of intensity behind it, whether it's punching someone in the face or it's tackling a business enterprise. What were some things that maybe gave you pause? Going right into it. So to me, it wasn't a question so much of this concerns me with their, their numbers or their model dynamics. What we didn't get was a super clear response to the question of customer acquisition cost. And I think that was some intentional veiling by Allie, which, you know, that's that's her decision to make. But because I didn't have that clarity on their customer acquisition cost, it's hard for me to run some numbers and understand, you know, to what level of scale does this need to get for me to get my return as an investor? 
Anything that stuck out to you? Yeah, I kind of want to elaborate on that point a little bit and not just look at Allie, but this is maybe a takeaway that I've had in doing over 20 of these podcasts so far. This idea that some of the best deal memos we have, where we have the most information and we're very excited about the company and the opportunity and we understand and we can quantify it in our head, come from founders who give crisp answers with a lot of numbers and then give the story. I think that founders that give a lot of storytelling and use a lot of adjectives really get you excited about the future of the company. But I don't walk away with the same level of understanding when I'm going through the deal memo and preparing my thoughts for what I think about the company, though I might leave the conversation more energized. Sure. It's, it's, it's a level of show, but don't tell. I got the vibe that it was less of a trying to, in, you know, some, some founders we talk to, it's clear they're trying to paint around a question. They're almost politicizing their answer, right? And that wasn't the feeling I got from most of our interview with Allie. More so, I just got a level of excitement that took her to the story. But at the end of the day, there were, there were some questions that we had that we didn't get answers to, which makes this part of the deal memo difficult when you're trying to look at quantifiable numbers and, and put a number to say, is this something that makes sense as a, a returnable company? Speaking of returns and numbers, we did get a couple of numbers throughout the interview. Here's the ones I have in front of me. If there's any I'm missing, please chime in. So I have 28% of customers repeat, 2% return rate, and over 10,000 sets coming up this year. Those are the three numbers that stuck out to me as telling a story. Were there any other numbers that popped out to you? I had those same numbers, and I think that 10,000 is useful to put in context of that was a 500 unit total in 2013, a 2,000 unit total in 2015. We don't have a lot of data from 2016 up until now, but the projection she kind of left out there was 10,000 sets this year. Still pretty great growth. The 28% repeat buy, I think, is a good figure, and I'm, I'm assuming that was from their first purchase. And not necessarily the second purchase. You talk about some people will buy a third set, and that's usually as a gift. I was excited, and this goes back to our original leg of the e-commerce and retail blitz with Loop Returns. I was excited to hear that return rate. That's very low, which is awesome and helps to knock things out. The number that really stuck out to me, actually the two numbers that stuck out to me that you didn't address, were in the United States, 6,000 women are entering menopause daily. 85% of them will have hot flashes, and that's estimated to be a $12 billion market with $2.6 billion of that being attributed to bed sheets and pillowcases. Yeah, that gets to the market sizing side of things, and it does feel like a huge market. You hear the, or read the stories in the journal or hear on podcasts about kind of the aging U.S. population. I'm not super familiar with hot flashes. I don't know that they happen for a couple years and then they go away or they stay for years once you hit menopause. I'm not completely sure on that. But assuming it's the latter, there is going to be a longer and longer period where people are having, women are having a need for this type of product. And that's one segment of the market, right? You still have people who have hyperhidrosis or some other medical condition, whether it's a combination with their medication it's larger than just this one figure that we have, which I think is a positive sign because that one figure alone is pretty compelling. Something I did want to touch on that came up in re-listening to this interview, Ali said they'd probably be raising a Series B here soon. So it is worth noting that besides having technically been founded in 2008, even though she says 2011 was the first year they considered themselves an e-commerce company, it does seem like this is a more mature company than, we've, than we typically have on the podcast. Something that stuck out to me as a positive sign that was a quick, concise answer that told a good story was her level of detail in thinking through her her channels and funnels when it comes and to what, acquisition. What, what about that was exciting or interesting to you? It just doesn't come up with many of the founders that we talk to that they are deep. It's, it's almost like an optimization and a level of awareness that you get to over time that Wicked Sheets is clearly at because they're they're selling through multiple channels. They have their own website. They have Amazon. They have QVC, Brookstone, 
they're aware of all these channels, they're established, and they're looking at, okay, since we have all these sales happening, how do we lower our acquisition costs or where do we spend our ad money to drive up these channels? It's just a, a level of maturity that I think you get to that de-risks this as an investment. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. I thought that there definitely were multiple questions where the idea of channels came up, and I, I definitely agree with you there. One thing that I wanted to mention that I was probably most excited about was the intense drive to make the product better. This idea, they had a commitment to the product, they had a commitment to testing. You made a bad dad joke about snot or something. <laughs> it was a good dad joke. Oh, but sorry. A, but a dad joke a, nonetheless. A great dad joke about snot. I really think that it seems like the product comes first. And I think when people do a great job of making the best product possible, whether that's creating a new line, which it sounds like they're doing, a new line of fabrics, or it's iterating on the same line that you've been working on, I think that that is the primary driver for success when you're creating a differentiated product. Yeah. What do you think about moving forward? I'm just going to jump because I think we've covered a lot of ground here pretty quickly. kind of want to jump to future casting. What are you looking for out of Wicked Sheets moving forward? What is there anything else that concerns you? Is there any th- type of signals that you're looking for? What's what's the future of Wicked Sheets in your mind that we should be looking for? In one word, it would just be focus because they had. I think they're raising their Series B to scale, and I, I might be projecting there, but if they're raising their Series B to scale. There's going to be a lot of cash that comes in the door and that idea of wicked wearables or wicked, uh, what was the name they had for uh, kids' clothes? Wicked sleepers. Those kind of things might be a distraction. I'm not sure that how much of a distraction or what they would be, but I think that they have such a big market that they could tackle here that if they can really focus and dominate the couple markets that they have, the hyperhidrosis, the menopause markets, the cancer, I think, was one that had come up. I think focusing and getting market penetration in those areas will allow them eventually to expand into those new things that they want. But yeah, focus would be the one word I would look at. What about you? Yeah, I'm looking to see how their channel strategy evolves and their entire marketing acquisition strategy. The crazy thing about QVC, and this is something that I brought up in the interview because I hear it from one of my clients in Unreal, you sell the product to QVC. So you know what you're selling to them for, but they can offer the product at whatever price they want. And they know going into 96 million homes, they're going to make their money on volume and not necessarily on margin. And so you get into this situation where you're competing with your own product for pricing. And it's kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation because that type of distribution, you can't turn down. She's been on QVC four times in the last month. That's amazing. That's probably doing incredible things for her. It's leading to this $10,000 or sent out 10,000 unit year. But it affects your entire channel strategy because if you're selling the same SKU on your website or on Amazon or on Brookstone or even walmart.com, wherever it is, people are going to be Searching Wicked Sheets is so easy to price online and QVC ranks so highly because they have so much domain authority. If you search Wicked Sheets right now, they come up on QVC. So I'm just looking to see how they battle that. Things I've heard in the past, and this is not really advice, just something I've heard in the past. Sometimes people make a separate type of SKU that they sell on QVC so that that discounted price is not directly competing with the other channels. It's just interesting. And so I want to see how how they formulate an entire strategy. She said she's already brought it up and talked to the board about it, whether that changes where they put their marketing dollars, whether they found, find a secret formula of actually we're doubling down on Google AdWords and driving people to the site, or we're willing to take the hit on QVC, but there comes with an insert that talks about wickedsheets.com. So six to seven weeks later when they're doing the repeat, they go to the website. I just want to hear some more clarity after they have, and not that they're lacking it now, there just hasn't been enough time. So I'm looking for, once more time has passed, what that strategy becomes. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think that plays into my idea of focus. You just elaborated and made it sound a lot better. So thank you for that. (laughs) Welcome back (laughs) to the United States, my friend. So I think overall, very impressed with the founder, impressed with the market size. I think that there are some 
lingering questions that we have specifically around numbers that we just didn't get to and a couple of areas of potential shadows. But it was a really fun podcast and I am excited we've had a company on that is a little bit older, but not too much older, that we can compare past guests to. Little interesting tidbit here. Next week, we're going to go the opposite way. Next week, we're going to talk to someone who is much younger than any of the other podcast guests we had. So it should be an interesting juxtaposition. Yeah, it's exciting. Through this podcast, I feel like I've learned a lot about e-commerce and retail, which I'm really into. And it is nice because you can you can model this stuff out pretty well when you have the data to play with. I, I do think e-commerce and retail businesses are attractive if they have the the numbers that work out. Yeah, I love I love hearing about the ins and outs of marketing and and how they actually bring the product to market, develop the product. That stuff's exciting to me. So this is fun. All right, guys, that's it for this week. If you guys have any thoughts on our interview with Allie, any of her responses, the company, we'd love to hear from you. Tweet at us at Upside FM or comment on Breaker. If you think that you would be a good guest for our show or you know a good guest for our show, feel free to email us as well. Hello at Upside.fm. And we'll talk to you next week. That's all for this week. Thanks for listening. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's guest. So shoot us an email at hello at upside.fm or find us on Twitter at upsidefm. We'll be back here next week at the same time talking to another founder in our quest to find upside outside of Silicon Valley. If you or someone you know would make a good guest for our show, please email us or find us on Twitter and let us know. And if you love our show, please leave us a review on iTunes. That goes a long way in helping us spread the word and continue to help bring high quality guests to the show. Eric and I decided there were a couple things we wanted to share with you at the end of the podcast, and so here we go. Eric Hornung and Jay Klaus are the founding parties of the Upside Podcast. At the time of this recording, we do not own equity or other financial interest in the companies which appear on this show. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinions of Duff & Phelps LLC and its affiliates, Unreal Collective LLC and its affiliates, or any entity which employ us. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. We have not considered your specific financial situation nor provided any investment advice on this show. Thanks for listening and we'll talk to you next week. Never mind.